The Oxford English Dictionary defines intelligence as the faculty of understanding. Looking further into this definition, the word understand, since the definition of understanding is simply to understand, is to comprehend, to apprehend the meaning or import of, or to grasp the idea of. Therefore, to be intelligent is to have the ability to understand or gain the importance from information. In Mark Bowerline's book, The Dumbest Generation, he seems to define intelligence as something akin to memorization of facts, rather than understanding the facts. In the very beginning of the book, and repeated on several occasions throughout, Bowerline cites test scores to, that show a clear decline in the results as the technological age grows. This tactic sets his argument up that there are, is zero evidence of the youth of today gaining intelligence from technology, but that it is the opposite. Technology breeds stupidity. The problem with this argument is evident in the definition of intelligence, and the way in which Bowerline judges intelligence in his book. While he does occasionally refer to the interpretation of material, his main focus is almost solely on vocabulary and the reciting of fact. Tests are mostly based on memor memorization of these facts. A student in high school might sit through hundreds of classes and take notes projected onto a screen for them. They write these facts down that are given to them by the teachers and later review these facts for their tests or exams. This act is not an act of understanding, as the definition of, in of intelligence suggests, but is an act of parroting. Students have a study period before a test to memorize facts for that test. As soon as they finish the test, the information is gone from their heads. The youth of today realize the truth about tests. They realize that there's no longer a need for memorization. Before the web was created, it would take hours to locate and learn facts without help. Now it takes a few seconds on Google and the facts are there. You can even cross-reference the information found to determine whether it is accurate. Because of the speed and ease with which information is attained, youth no longer need to memorize facts, so they don't have to spend hours finding information again. The information comes just as fast as it would if it were memorized, just through another means. The web has become the memory of the technological generation. What Bowerline refuses to realize is that tests are just as old as books are, and they need to change in response to the changing world, just like the classroom has. He never addresses tests as a possible problem, though he does address te teaching styles, lack of reading, TV, and social networking. If he were to talk about testing, it would risk destroying the basis of his argument, which would fall apart without his supposed evidence. The tests aren't the only problem with Bowerline's book either. There's clear evidence of cherry picking in terms of the numbers he uses as evidence. He only ever compares two given years at a time. 1998 versus 2004 is probably the most frequent. Not only that, but he also creates a clear bias towards his points when addressing the numbers. If there's a slight decrease in an average test score, this decrease is a monumental failure to him. But if a test score increases slightly, it is not much better or a disappointment, disappointing improvement and is brushed off as unimportant. Furthermore, to him, if the numbers of students passing a test is above 50%, this is still bad because they dropped by one point. But if they're below 50%, this is terrible simply because it's below half. This kind of bias is problematic as it sways the reader to agree not through logic and truth, but through the, war the warping of such things. Bowerline doesn't just use cut and dry tests to support his point either. He uses several surveys to gain insight into the lives of the youth of today and the past. The problem with this kind of source being used to draw conclusions is the inaccuracy of the numbers. By this, I don't mean that people lie, but I do mean that people misinterpret or outright misunderstand the questions that are asked of them. Unlike school tests, the question have not been asked before. When I say, what is your favorite book, do I mean novel, nonfiction, magazine, comic book, any printed text? One example of a question Bowerline uses in his argument is, in the last 12 months, did you read any poetry? Apparently the results were, were abysmal, but then Bowerline goes on to explain that rap is poetry and assumes that the teen should have answered accordingly. Would a teen agree? <laughs> Doubtful. To a teen, poetry is written down on paper with rhymes and line numbers. Rap is music to them. End of story. Questions and surveys such as this tend to be vague, poorly worded, and overall problematic in supporting a factual argument. By assuming that the questions will be interpreted a certain way and drawing conclusions based on that assumption, Bowerline creates inaccurate evidence that supports his argument only because it forces him to. One big argument Bowerline makes is that television is a huge problem in youth lives. He argues that children should read more rather than watch this, the series of flitting images on the screen. To him, things go by too fast to digest, and that makes the attention span dwindle. 
My counterargument is simple. Consider the time when stage plays were being published in books. These things were written for the explicit purpose, purpose of being watched on stage, acted before your eyes. What good was publishing it if you could, couldn't see it? Bowerline's argument is the exact opposite, only because books had been his means of getting a good story. This example shows how truly biased his argument is. Just because television is new does not mean it is worse than what is old. Not only that, but television is closer to plays than books were. Why is that bad? On the topic of politics, Bowerline, like many middle-aged adults, complains about the lack of youth voting. He believes the youth don't vote because they do not care or want to put in the effort to learn about and pay attention to politics in the government. What he fails to address is the, that very few politicians seem to care about the youth enough to create a platform for them. It is always centered around families or the working class or the big businesses. What is the point in supporting someone when their promises have nothing to do with you? Of course, Bowerline would probably argue that this kind of mindset is exactly the problem with the youth of today with them being so self-centered. But is it so wrong to want a politician to make life for a young adult easier too? Another point Bowerline tries to make is that students are getting dumber the older they get. He tested freshmen in civics and then tested seniors in civics and the seniors scored worse. I spoke to an American friend of mine the other day and asked him about civics classes in high school. According to him, students are only required to take civics twice, the initial class as a freshman and then in the advanced class as a sophomore. That means that a senior would not have taken a civics class for two years. With this evidence in mind, it makes the test score numbers seem a lot less convincing and makes his point collapse on itself. Despite the problems with his book, there are a few points that I have to agree with. The youth of today does seem pretty moronic. The internet breeds bad grammar and bad attitudes. I agree wholeheartedly when Bowerline says that vocabulary is the key to learning. If you have a wide vocabulary, you are more likely to get through difficult texts. Not only that, but a wide vocabulary makes it easier to guess the meaning of a word through the context of its use. Reading builds many skills. Another important point which I agree with is that the young people give up on things which are difficult much too quickly. Rather than work hard to understand something, youth today seem to move on to something more interesting. It's a sad reality, and I can even admit to doing it with math. I even agree with Bowerline's point that the youth of today are delusional, thinking that they're better at things than they actually are. The standard in, standards in high school have been lowered so much that a student can no longer receive a zero on an assignment. The unrealistic nature of the classroom has made the youth expect more than they deserve for the least amount of effort. There are many more problems I could point out regarding bad interpretation, hasty generalizations, traditionalism, and an over-cynical view of the world but I don't have the time to touch upon everything. Thus, I must conclude. Overall, Bowerline's point makes sense. Yes, the youth of today are uncaring and unmotivated to learn and to be intelligent. There are, however, several issues with the parts of his argument. Not only that, but the way in which he starts the book alienates any youth who may be reading it, making them less inclined to finish the book. His use of extremely inflammatory language is offensive and tiring. His downpour of test scores, surveys, and statistics overwhelms the, the reader to the point that they want to agree with him to make it stop. His logos creates an argumentum ad nauseum that literally leaves the reader nauseous. Besides, how can you deny the facts he presents when he presents too many to even reasonably look into? In the end, the format of The Dumbest Generation establishes Bowerline as authoritative. He uses complex language to make himself out to be smarter than the reader and simultaneously supports his point that a wider vocabulary means a more intelligent person. He uses scores of anecdotes to make himself seem more human and more friendly when in reality, he's just establishing the fact that he's better than everyone else for noticing the stupidity that others would like to cover up. He even appeals to the patriotic nature of the American people in the final chapter of the book in a last ditch attempt to say, America was meant to be this way because the founders said so, don't let them down. Overall, The Dumbest Generation is not convincing to me. The only section of the book which had me truly agreeing was the betrayal of the mentors, and the only reason for that is the removal of blame from the youth themselves. I understand now that I wasn't so much agreeing because I agreed every single adolescent and young adult was a moron, but was agreeing because it was no longer an attack on me. I wanted to find something to agree with because I didn't want to hate the book. At the end of the day, though, I still wish I could set Bowerline's book on fire, even if I despise the mistreatment of literature.